Hi, everybody. Welcome to episode number eight of the Camera Shake podcast with Nick Kirby and me, Kirsten Nuts, the photo and video podcast coming at you straight out of isolation into your eardrums. We'll be talking about talk life in lockdown, what's happening in the world outside, and if we're lucky, we'll hit on photography too. But before we get started, please throw us a solid and subscribe to this podcast. And if listening to our super smooth voices isn't enough for you, you can check us out in glorious Technicolor over on YouTube. So how are you this week? Good. Been been doing all right, thanks. Um, uh, most recent thing I've been doing is actually creating a uh, a quiz um, for a Zoom call um, on mm. Monday night, uh, yeah. which has taken a lot longer than I anticipated. Um, kind of regretting agreeing to do it now. <laughs> what kind of quiz are you doing? Are you um, doing different rounds? Yeah, there's um, five rounds and a bonus round, and it's um, half music related and uh, half movie related. Um, so I've got, you know, are these you know, real or fake band names around on that? I've got um, finish the lyric, um, so play a snippet of a song, and they need to um, remember what the next line of the song would be. Mm -hmm. Um, bonus points if they sing it back uh, during the answers, of course. Oh, okay, cool. Um, and then a couple of rounds, you know, name the film from the still image and um, also a body count <laughs> uh, <laughs> round. So two films, which one had the highest body count? <laughs> <laughs> That's a great idea. <laughs> I might steal that because incidentally, um, my wife and I, we're, we're doing the, the family quiz um, mm -hmm. this week. So, you know, we've got to put the thing together. We're doing one round, um, which is basically me playing guitar riffs and they have to guess which what riff it is. I considered it and then it felt, oh, God. that's going to take a bit of work. <laughs> so I thought, God, no, I can't do it. A lot of audio work this past week or so. Um, talking with my band about uh, the video we're going to create for our latest rec sort of lockdown recording, uh, which is going to mm. be Disco 2000 by Pulp, um, which is uh, nice and... Can we call that retro these days? Uh, yeah. Well, let me tell you. So when I was putting this, uh, this, this quiz round together, you know, with guitar riffs, um, I realized that my, uh, my teenage stepdaughter really wouldn't be able to to guess any of those. <laughs> and like, we're talking, you know, some of those are classic riffs, like Sweet Home Alabama, you know, whatever. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah, but uh, she wouldn't have a clue, like, honestly. <laughs> and yeah. of course, you know, you look at um, the kind of music that she's into, and really there aren't really any guitar riffs, but there isn't any guitar in there, so, mm. you know, it's kind of, it's, yeah, it's proven. It was um, interesting, anyway. You need to educate her in the world of music. I'm trying. <laughs> <laughs> Not so much of a problem with my youngest, you know. She's like uh, she's into grunge at the moment, so that's kind of cool. Oh wow. Yeah. Wow. My um my godson, um he's into Metallica at the moment. Oh cool. Yeah. Goes to sleep listening to Metallica. <laughs> Ooh, nice. Well, Kara's into Incubus. What um what have you been up to last week or so? Um it's strangely it's been a busy week actually. Um I've done a little bit of photography, so I've done um a couple of different just different things at home, really. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I started bullet journaling. Oh, so I don't know if you, if you know what it is. Do you know what it is? No, just describe it to me. Well, so bullet journaling is um, a system. Uh, it's basically like a, a diary system that allows you to uh, organize your day, essentially. Okay. It's, it's called bullet journaling because it's based on uh, bullet points. You know, mm -hmm. um, but this sort of a number of different, um, you basically, you set up your, your journal in a specific way. So you have, you index things, um, and you have, uh, monthly spreads and weekly spreads and daily spreads. Maybe, um, it's just a way that you organize it. Um, and you know, you can, you can add trackers to it and you can track certain things. Like I'm tracking my water intake and my coffee consumption <laughs> because, you know, I drink a lot of coffee. Not today, though, because today I'm drinking water. But yeah. how many coffees have you had today? Two. Oh. I've had today. Yeah, it's, yeah. And that is half my allowance. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm limiting myself to four cups of coffee a day, which is not a lot for me normally. That, see, that's the most I've... I, I haven't drunk more than four cups of coffee in a day for years now, until I got my, uh, my espresso mach machine. Yeah. That day, I had a lot of coffee. Um, yeah, so the bullet journal method was uh, created by a guy called Ryder Carroll. 
And um, and I've actually, I mean, I've only been doing it for about two weeks, but I've found it really helpful. Yeah, it's been it's been a great way to organize my week, and um, it's helped me to keep my focus on uh, you know daily tasks. And like I said, you know, it's it's helped me to track certain things mm. uh, because you know. With the whole lockdown thing, and I know lockdown is sort of easing now, but um, I really need to kind of get back into exercising. And it's just by journaling that it helps me to keep track mm. of what I'm doing. Mm-hmm. You know, so, so are you doing yeah. that on your phone, on a calendar, in pen and paper? Oh, well, so the whole point in bullet journaling is, is that it's pen and paper. Okay. Um, it's sort of, um, it's often called, you know, some analog time in an otherwise digital world. <laughs> I see. And that's part of why it's so effective, I think, is because you actually have to take the time out and literally sit down and think about it and, you know, think about the tasks for the next week. So I kind of prepare weekly spreads that kind of works for me. So it, basically you start with a monthly, uh, a monthly spread and you just think about the month ahead and all the things that are happening, like maybe you put in birthdays or, you know, particular events um, that you've got coming up. Mm-hmm. Um and then you essentially take that information and you move that into your weekly spread. So you're kind of constantly moving information around. And what that does is um, it sort of ingrains itself into your brain. Surely if you make it too complicated, you end up spending more time organizing yourself than actually doing things. Yeah, that's true. But um, but it's sort of me time, you know. Um, so yeah. it's not just sitting down and just uh, sort of planning the day ahead. To give you a good example, so what, what I... What I would ordinarily do is like, I would wake up in the morning, you know, I'll get up really early. Like I wake up anytime between five and six and I'm up, that's it, you know? Um, and normally what I would do is I would, you know, go downstairs, make a coffee, you know, sit down, look at my phone, right? And, um, and start the day that way. And I, I don't know, look at Facebook and, you know, read some news article or whatever. It's not really very productive time. Mm. So what I do now is, you know, I get up and I still make a coffee and I sit down and I look at my bullet journal um, and I look at the day ahead. And actually um, what I'm doing there is I'm using that time, you know, productively because I'm already kind of ahead of the curve, if you know what I mean. So, um, and it's just a, it's kind of a habit that I'm forming, which I find really quite useful. Mm. Um, And it also gives me an opportunity to prioritize things and to think about the different tasks, you know, and to think like, right, actually, you know, I don't need to do this today. I have more time on Wednesday, you know, um, because it sort of helps me not to overschedule things. Um, I have a tendency to cram lots of things into one day and then um, having to move things on because, you know, there's no way of me... um, finishing all the tasks that I had scheduled. So it helps me to kind of spread the the workload um, across the week more easily. Mm. You'll have to give us uh, an update in a few weeks to see if you've, you know, continued using the same method and how it's, uh, how it's worked <laughs> yeah. out then. Yeah. And so, you know, you can, you can be, like I said, you can be as creative as you want. Um, I like to write in ink. So that's what I do in my journal. I just use ink for that. Mm-hmm. Um, and just, you know, yeah, it's fun. But yeah, let's let's see how it goes. You know, I've been doing this is my second week, so early days. Cool. <laughs> so that's really the the biggest change. Um I think I mean one thing that's happening now in the UK is that the whole lockdown thing is um easing up a little bit. Shops are opening um as from this week. So um, you know, people will be able to go out more and we're now able to to mix with other households to a limited degree. Um, so life is very slowly, very slowly getting back to the way it used to be. Do you you feel that? Hopefully in, um, in a few weeks time, we'll be able to do these actually face to face. Yes. Well, that'd be a very special episode when we're actually in the same room for the very first time, (laughs) like 10 episodes in 12 episodes in whatever it is. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, So, uh, that'd be good. Cool. Have you done any, um, uh, any videos or photos or anything this week? This week, no. Um, not a huge... Am- <laughs> so my cat's about to <laughs> knock over the uh, reflector that's on my right hand side oh. right now. Can you stop? Do you mind? <laughs> so we've decided um, that we want to open up the photo challenges to our listeners and viewers. So we're going to run a monthly photo challenge uh, where we set the subject, as it were, the topic, and people can send in their uh, photos 
or videos um, about that set topic. And then uh, we'll have a look at them and we will we'll choose the, the winning uh, entry and we will then have the winner on the show uh, the following week. So if you're interested in taking part, um, we will give you all the details at the end of the show. So, you know, stay tuned and we'll talk about that in a little while. Right, so I guess it's time to actually talk about some uh, photography um, and videography um, on the show. So, Nick, what has caught your eye this week? Um, first up, I've noticed a couple of, um, you know me, I like a bit of tech-related stuff. Um, and one of those is, very quickly, Panasonic finally released this software update for to be able to use your, um, your Panasonic camera as a webcam. Um, which is great. About time. It's in um, beta mode at the moment, so I'm guessing the full full version will be out very very shortly. A um, couple of caveats with it. Uh, one, hang on, let me guess. Go on, go on. Is, what it, do you is, think it, for, is it for li- is it for Linux only? <laughs> yes, <laughs> Linux for the one user that's still out there. Yeah. <laughs> so um, close. It is currently for Windows only. Um, so Mac. <laughs> Who knows? There's no mention of when it's going to come to Mac, um, hopefully mm-hmm. soon. Um, and the other caveat we- is um, that e- the software won't enable your camera to be seen as a webcam by something like Zoom. Um, so you will need fr- uh, free software like OBS, which will basically enable it to be seen. Uh, it's, it's, it's not a big deal. It's quite straightforward to set up. Is, is there a particular reason why that is? Because it's just like, it seems such a half-baked thing then. No, no. I, I, I don't know is the honest answer. Um, uh, it, it seems silly, but mm. I'm, I'm just happy that they're uh, they're en- enabling this now without having to have a <laughs> capture card. Baby, baby steps. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. And, you know, maybe after lockdown, all of this software that all these companies have been doing will suddenly stop working. Hmm. Oh, Who knows? Controversial. That's, that's, controversial. That's an interesting, interesting thought there. <laughs> so it is, you know, it's a step in the right direction. Um, hopefully, you know, that'll all be up and running properly and for us us Mac users too. Speaking of Mac, the other thing I um, came across today is that we're expecting Apple to announce on the 22nd of June that Apple are almost certainly going to drop Intel from their... MacBooks, iMacs, and so forth from what? sometime next year. Wow. And start okay. using their own processors. Is that a good thing? Is that a bad thing? Mm, who knows? Um, what we do well. know is that what they're going to start making the, the kind of specs, I guess, if you like, available for developers from the sometime in late June because mm. software needs to know how these processes are going to work to know how to utilize the processor properly. Mm. So if you take Premiere Pro or Final Cut, that uses the number of cores and the number of threads and so forth in a processor in certain ways to maximize um, its efficiency and to get the most out of that processor. Now, if Mac have created their own processors, that needs a whole rework. So. We may see problems with these when they first come out with software. And so it could be a while before, you know, software can really use the, the new processes properly. Who mm. knows? I don't know. I'm making assumptions here. But, you know, knowing how some of um, Adobe's updates of late <laughs> have caused no ends of, end of problems for me, um, yeah. I'm expecting some issues. So. Um, I like to upgrade. I've, I've started on kind of a new cycle of upgrading my MacBook and my iPad and phone and so forth. When major updates come out, um, I may actually hold off now because I'm not sure I'm going to want that in 2021. Um, I might wait until they're all squared away with mm. uh, any problems, but we'll see. We'll see. The other part to go with that is that we're also expecting Mac to announce, probably not in June, but that they're also going to be doing their own graphics cards. So their graphics cards that you're using right now will eventually go away too. Mm. That is also a potential problem because, you know, as I'm sure you're aware, graphics cards are a major component of how well Photoshop or Premiere Pro or Final Cut Cut work. 
if you're using the integrated um, graphics card, like within the Intel chip, for example, that software doesn't run very mm -hmm. well at all. It's really slow. So you want a very powerful graphics card to be able to cope with that, particularly if you're using your 4K footage. Mm -hmm. And then they're doing some other engine around AI too. So a few different things coming up from Mac in uh, the next year or so. So I'm really intrigued at the end of the month to see what they do announce and when it's, uh, which MacBooks and iMacs they're gonna gonna put it into. So yeah, there's a couple mm. of techy techy related ones for me. So do you think there's a? I mean, what's the reason behind behind that? Because I remember years ago, um, Mac moved from their own proprietary chipsets to Intel. Yeah. That's right, and you know, and now obviously they're moving back to uh, to um, proprietary chips. They've been so working how... on the, these particular processes secretly, by the sound of it, for years and years and years. And I hmm. suspect they feel they've got to a point now where their chips are going to ultimately be better than Intel's, is my assumption, or at least equivalent. Hmm. And if they are equivalently equivalently as good. Uh, it's got to be cheaper for them to manufacture their own and put them into their own machines than mm -hmm. it is to you know buy in so to speak uh, Intel's chips. Uh, I don't know. That's my my assumption is ultimately a cost a cost saving there somewhere. Hmm. It'd be interesting to see how that pans out. Yeah. What about yourself? Anything you've come across this week? Well, I came across uh, some uh, really hilarious news stories. Okay. So. Um, Landscape photographer Gwarav Ograwi, he is very sad that his photos went viral and ended up breaking Android phones. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I need more detail on that. <laughs> right. Okay. So, so, so Gwarav is a, um, a landscape photographer okay. and uh, he went out and he, uh, he took some pictures of Glacier National Park. And uh, he be he began posting those, um, and so so his photos that were taken on a Nikon uh, D850 actually, um, they ended up literally bricking Android phones all over the world. So these photos went viral because they actually uh, you know they're stunning uh, landscape shots mm -hmm. with you know mountains and um, fantastic skies and you know sunlight and so the reason why that happened is actually quite interesting. And I completely was not aware of this. So he took the photographs and uh, did some basic editing in Adobe Lightroom. And when he exported the images, he changed the color space from sRGB, which is what you would normally use, to something called Pro Photo RGB. And as it turns out, Android phones are not able to basically deal with that color space. And it ended up bricking them, oh, it's something known as a soft brick um, because it's, you know, it basically requires a factory reset um, to get the phone working again. But yeah, so who would have known? I mean, I wouldn't have known that. I mean, interestingly enough, Apple devices actually didn't experience that, pro that problem. And he wasn't aware of that himself until quite some time later because he happened to have an iPhone, so he never knew. <laughs> He's quite happily looking at his pictures and half the world went down. Half the world of Android. That's an absolutely unbelievable. So, so uh, why, why, why does iPhone cope with it fine and Android doesn't? That seems crazy. Yeah, there's, there's really, um, I don't think that's this particular, uh, a specific explanation for that. Mm. So this, this uh, Pro Photo color space is uh, basically unreadable by a large number of Android phones. So it doesn't seem like. It's all Android phones, but it's, it's a, a large percentage of Android phones. Perhaps all it's actually ones. mostly it's mostly those by Google and Samsung. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so you know, in his you know ingeniously designed cyber attack, he took out all of Google and Samsung's phones. Very clever. Okay. Another question. <laughs> yeah. Why? Why did, does he to explain why he chose that color space rather than the standard sRGB? Um, I don't think, I mean, it sounds like he wasn't really thinking about it. It's just something, you know, he just did That's for no apparent reason whatsoever. It seems like a conscious decision to, to do that. Cause it's, 
I, I've never selected anything other than sRGB. I want, I, I, actually, be after this, I'm going to have, have a little look into those color spaces and understand what the difference mm. between them really is. So color space simply defines the number of gamuts that can make up different colors. Mm -hmm. So um, most of the time, you know, we would work in sRGB uh, color space. And, you know, as long as your camera is set up to the same a color space and your editing software and your monitor, then you can make sure that the colors that you produce in camera are within the same color space and look very similar to, you know, what you'll see on the screen. Mm -hmm. um, when it comes to printing, however, things are a little bit different because uh, when you use, when you print, you move from RGB colors to CMYK colors because mm -hmm. now it's different inks that make up your colors. And um, so therefore you could potentially, you know, maybe even have a greater variety um, of different tones and colors that you could, uh, that you could create that way. So there are different color spaces that would be used for that. Adobe RGB is another color space that's, what's that, you know, it's not as common uh, as, as RGB, but it's, it's one that, that people might, uh, you know, recognize. Um, but Pro Photo RGB, you know, I've certainly never worked in that color space mm -hmm. um, myself, and it's, it's not really something um, that I would use, uh, predominantly because I, I don't actually print very much, personally. You know, in my work, um, it's very much uh, digital imagery that I create, so uh, printing doesn't really come into it to a, to a massive extent, you know. Mm. Um, it's something I'd like to look into a little bit more and something I would like to develop, for sure. Um, and that's, you know, what color spaces might become a little bit more uh, important. But given that he was creating, you know, digital images, there was really no need for him, I don't think, uh, to play around with the, with the color space at all. So I think maybe he changed the color space by mistake or maybe he just didn't know what he was doing or didn't understand or well, who knows, I don't know. But... Um, Anyway, so it turns out that uh, Google and Samsung phones, uh, Google and Samsung phones, um, don't like the the Pro Photo RGB color space. Simple solution, eh? Just use an iPhone. Hey, <laughs> not that argument again. Apple fanboy, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh God, the comments are going to be flying in. Oh, okay, yeah, I'm sure. Right now, I'm sure. <laughs> I came across. Uh, Something that caught, you know, it was really quite interesting, this, uh, really creative. Um, there's an artist called Adam Hillman, and he describes himself as an object arranger. And nope. I guess he, you know, takes similar objects and just positions them creatively and takes photos. In itself, mm -hmm. you know, sound, sounds great. And he typically does this with, with food. But a recent set of photos he's released is very different and what what he's done is he's taken you know there's a handful of them but if i just take the one that i'm looking at right now which should be on your screen mm. about now is he's taken fruits but the fruits he's taken are all fruits which have similar colors he's laid a square uh, piece of cloth which is red on the table he's then placed these fruits on red fruits like grapes strawberries, peppers, raspberries, apples, and he's placed them on top of this red cloth. Mm. He's sliced into them as well to create texture where the colors are the same, but then where the cloth stops, he's left different colors of those um, fruits and vegetables outside of the red cloth. So you've got pure red on the inside and then other colors of these fruits on the outside. So give you an example of what that might look like. Mm -hmm. uh, a watermelon is red on the inside and green on the outside. So he sliced a, uh, the watermelon so that inside the cloth, it, you could only see the red. And on the outside, you've got the outside green of the watermelon. An app, red apple, the outside is on within the cloth, so the red part of the apple, but he's cut into the apple in a square shape so that the outside has the, you know, the kind of creamy colored of the inside of an apple. Mm. And then a, I guess, what do you call those? Blood oranges? Uh, so the inside of those are red. So he's got a slice of that, but the outside mm. are orange still. So on the outside of the mm. cloth, it's got the orange. Very, very cool. 
It looks fantastic how he's done it. And he's got loads of different ones. He's done one with chocolate where mm. he's got packages. The packaging is orange. So in one corner, you've got the packaging, which is orange. And then within those, it opens out into actual chocolate around it. Mm. Other sections of the same photo have red packagings. Um, and then the kind of gold color of a Twix and Quality Street and mm. uh, things like that. And arrange them to patterns. Very, very creative. A lot of food possibly going to waste there, but it looks really, really good. So as long as that food didn't go to waste, I'm all over that. Very, very cool. Very, very creative. Interesting. Yeah, food photography is definitely something to look into. Yeah. That may be a nice challenge one day. Ah, yes, it would. Well, see, the, the problem is, though, I really eat with my eyes. <laughs> you know, when I see good looking food, I don't know whether there'd be enough time for it to be photographed. It'd be just, uh, mm. I just have to. Just devour all of it. <laughs> well, you're just going to have, uh, have to have a little bit of self-control in that challenge. It's hard. <laughs> what else have you uh, come across this week? Um, well, interestingly enough, <laughs> so, you know, I've been playing with a lot of apps on my phone, mm -hmm. um, obviously over the last, well, couple of months, I should say. And I'm naturally always interested in photography apps. And there's all sorts of different apps that you can get. I mean, Adobe make, um, you know, all the, like the Lightroom and Photoshop apps. There's a whole variety of different Photoshop apps um, that you can use on your phone. Um, and some of them I find really useful. Um, for example, Lightroom is a really good example. I've edited a lot of stuff on the go um, in Lightroom. So even if, you know, it might be... Uh, photos that I obviously take with the phone, but also photos that I take uh, with my Fuji and I just transfer them onto my phone and I give it a quick edit. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and also you can use it as almost like a database so you can have, uh, you can upload, uh, you know, images that you're working on on your desktop and then you can carry on uh, working on them yeah. on your phone or, you know, iPad or whatever. Um, so some of those, uh, some of those apps are really, really useful. And of course, there are lots of really playful um, photo apps uh, available as well. Just, you know, apps that you can use to, um, I don't know, use different filters and, you know, um, just alter your images in, in any way, shape or form. Uh, some of them are really clever. Some of them are very basic. Um, but Adobe has just come out with yet another Photoshop, Photoshop type of app. Mm -hmm. um, and it's called Photoshop Camera. And it's free. Oh. Totally, absolutely, 100% free. Um, and what it does is it's basically, it basically, uh, it's aimed at uh, people who post a lot of images to social media. So Facebook, Instagram, um, Twitter, whatever. And so it's essentially, uh, using the Adobe sensei engine mm. to add filters to your photos. So you have, um, you have a choice of, I don't know how many, a lot of different filters that you can use, um, and uh, I've, I've tested it. I've tried it. It's you know, it's a playful kind of app. It's a, it's a bit of fun, essentially. But I have to say, I mean, the images look really good. Okay. You know, in terms of quality, they're really high quality um, images. Some of those filters tend to degrade the the basic image a little yeah. bit, um, but these ones actually do look pretty good. So um, it's definitely aimed at the sort of you know social media savvy. Yeah, you know, just want to take a photo with my phone slap some filters on it, have a little bit of fun with it and post it to my profile type of, uh, type of consumer. But yeah, I mean, it's, you know, using some decent technology behind, behind it or under the hood. So it's, yeah, it's really quite impressive. That's great. I mean, the Adobe's AI is pretty, pretty damn good. Yeah. Um, so I'm, you know, if it is using that, that's, I'm, I'm sure it's come out quite, I'm going to, I'm going to download that later today. And uh, see see how that is and what uh, how that works out. I mean, I use um, I use the the Lightroom app all the time, um, mm. just for again just for general photos that I might have taken on my phone and whatnot. The control mm. within it is quite astounding, really, given that it's just an app on your phone. But I also use the um, uh, the, the one that you introduced me to a while back. Actually, was um, Adobe uh, Capture. Oh yeah, and you know, for for those of you who who may not have heard of Adobe Capture, um, it's a basic little app that allows you to get it's, it's like a color picker with your camera primarily, right? Um, and then you so you can put your camera up to whatever it might be, a you know a book, a, you know any color on a poster or anything like that, 
and you can uh, have it select what that color actually is. So you get the, the, the RGB for it or the hex code and whatnot. Mm -hmm. But the, the, the other cool thing that it does is that it then gives you color palettes relating to that color, um, which is incredibly helpful if you're designing something within Photoshop or Illustrator, um, but just to get an idea of what colors could go together. Um, and Kay, correct me if I'm wrong, but if uh, I think you can then get it to kind of resort the color palettes for different style of color palettes. Is that right? Yeah, there's a whole a whole range of different things you can do with that app. Um, so the the um, the color part of it is only one part. Of this uh, you can um, you can you know take a photo of something and turn that into a, I believe into like a PNG or something like that. It's or into a GIF. So there's a whole range of different uh, little really useful little options mm -hmm. um, in that. Uh, I predominantly use it in the same way that you use it, just to um, you know. Um, identify color palettes. Um, interesting thing, though, a little fun thing. If you're watching a movie and you think like, wow, the color grading, very technical thing here, by the way, for all those color nerds amongst us. Um, but yes, yeah, so if you watch a movie and you kind of think the color in this movie is really cool. It's like, you know, it looks great. If you hold that phone up to the screen, it'll give you a color palette, um, which comes in handy if you're trying to, you know, edit a photo and you're trying to kind of get it to look similar to that movie. So I found that's, uh, that's actually worked out a few times. <laughs> that's <laughs> Just to give interesting. It that, that kind I, of matrix look or something, you know. I'd not considered doing that before. That's a really <laughs> interesting idea. Yeah, yeah. You have to adjust it a little bit, but sure. you know, you're pretty much, I mean, you know, ballpark, you're yeah. there, you know, it's, uh, yeah, it's really quite good. So uh, yeah, Adobe are coming up with um, a whole range of different apps that are uh, useful, you know, for professionals as well as, um, you know, um, amateurs or just, you know, photo enthusiasts, if you want. Yeah. Um, and I think Adobe Camera um, or Photoshop Camera is, that's probably, that's like in the enthusiast kind of, you know, yeah. um, part of, uh, of those kind of apps. So uh, I would say it's a fun thing. Um, I, to, to, to be absolutely honest, I don't really see myself using it, <laughs> you know, um, but, um, it's certainly something that probably my kids would use. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's good to know, yeah. it's good to have those, those things that are out there. And, you know, I get, I get asked all the time, oh, you know, is there some, you know, by people who don't necessarily take photos, um, you know, but they just take stuff on their phone and they just want it to look good. They're always asking me, what can I use to quickly, you know, get this to look look decent it's like well yeah. now i've got a great great app that i can can share with them and it, uh, you know it's good yeah. it's really good that adobe are doing these these items you know i'm guessing you know they're you know giving it away for free they're gearing towards getting a subscription to lightroom and photoshop and so forth no doubt but yeah i think i mean this is you know one of the um uh, one of the filters in there is called the billy eilish filter of course it is so uh, you know so i mean it, that really tells you enough about the age group that that's yeah, uh, aimed at. But of course, what that does is it gets people using um, Adobe products. Absolutely. And so, you know, once they're using that, it's not, you know, then moving from that to Lightroom or to Photoshop or whatever, it's not a million yeah. miles away. So, you know, yeah, you're getting people into the system as it were yeah, that it's, way. It's a clever um, move. It's a very clever move. Now, the issue I have with it is that, you know, I love the fact that they're doing it, but I wish they would have hired new people to do it rather than taking them off Photoshop and Premiere Pro and letting them go to waste as they have been in the 2020 versions. <laughs> yeah. God. There's been some issues in the 2020 version. Yeah, for I'm sure, a little yeah. upset with Premiere Pro at the moment. <laughs> yeah, I'm, a bit, I'm, I'm upset with Photoshop. Yeah, same thing. Um, yeah, it's it's, it's crazy. Thing. They introduced some fantastic features, some real good improvements here and there, but let everything else that was good about it before slip. Very frustrating. Yeah. yeah, it's an interesting thing. So with Photoshop 2020, and I mean, we've had this discussion many times before, but uh, just for the listeners. So um, uh, Photoshop 2020 has introduced um, a couple of really useful new tools. W one of them is the object selector tool, which is essentially a selector tool that um, is you just draw a box um, over a particular object, and it will essentially just identify and select that object without you having to do any kind of, you know, uh, detailed selection yourself. So it's a, it's a massive, massive time saver and it works really well. Like the AI behind it is very, mm -hmm. very, very clever. 
because you got to think about, yeah, how does that, I mean, how does, how does Photoshop know what it is that you want to select? Just, just, you know, uh, so it is very clever. And these, these tools are getting better and better with every new, um, you know, incarnation of Photoshop. Um, but what I have experienced with uh, the 2020 version is that it's just really unstable. Yeah. And uh, to the point where, you know, I can see, well, I spend more time looking at a spinning ball, as it were, than uh, having the thing working. And, you know, the minute I go back to 2019, or the 2019 version, everything works. Yeah. Absolutely perfect. So, you know, it's a give and take. Um, these two or three new functions or new, uh, new tools, you know, I can see them being really useful. Um, but at the moment, they're slowing down my workflow yeah. to such a degree that it's completely unusable to me. Absolutely. And you know, Premiere so. Pro has is, is, is gone exactly the same way. I, don't, I really don't know what's going on over Adobe with, with that at the moment. But I'm so frustrated with Premiere Pro, I've wanted to throw my Mac, my MacBook. <laughs> and that is precisely why I'm using Final Cut Pro. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it used to be brilliant, Premiere. I don't, yeah, it's very frustrating. <laughs> so Adobe, if you are listening, mm. one other, other interesting thing I saw this week was on on YouTube actually, and it's from uh, the Garage Learning uh, channel, and a guy called Matt Huber, and he you know, he's been a photographer for many 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 years, and um, but he's he's released a video which describes how he created his first catapult. All right? Yeah. <laughs> now, why would you want a catapult as a uh, photographer? Well it's to do splash photography. And oh. so he creates images of, you know, water basically splashing on a product. That's mm -hmm. the you know, general gist of it, right? You know, this type of, you know, like a perfume bottle, you might see water splashing on, you know, those kind of images, right? Yeah. And, but he created himself a catapult with a cup on the end that springs up and will, um, will you know, the water will come out of the cup and go onto the product. All right, that in itself is quite cool. You know, he uses a piece of wood, cup on the end, a bungee cord on one end, and then a tie cool. on the other end, so that the bungee has the spring. You mm -hmm. put it, um, lift it up, and let it go, and it will spring forward like that. But the cord on the other end doesn't allow it to go too far, rather than going all the way forward. So it will stop mm. it. It gives it a bit of a jolt. And so the water will come out and will come out at the same kind of angle and velocity each time. Uh, he just goes into detail about how he does that. But the other interesting thing to do with it, it he's attached a, um, a remote trigger to it, which connects to his camera. So there's, a, there's basically a button at, the, at one end. So as soon as it reaches its peak, this button depresses, which then triggers a remote trigger which then ha he can set a time delay on, which will then trigger his camera. Mm -hmm. So he will then go through a bit of trial and error saying, okay, as soon as that triggers, you know, what photo am I getting? Okay, great. Okay, that's a little early. And then he set a delay in milliseconds so he gets the right moment um, to capture it. And his face is a really, really, really cool. You know, he sets it, um, you know, product up on a piece of Perspex. Um, across, you know, a couple of stands and whatnot. And he will just set this up and go for it. Now, I want to try this, but I don't want to get my house soaking wet. <laughs> I'm going to get it wrong. I know I am. <laughs> it's going to go absolutely ev everywhere. So I'm going to need a load of plastic sheeting, I think, to kind of protect myself. But it, the yeah. images look great, and I really, really want to give it a go. Have, have you ever done any kind of splash photography before? Yeah, I've done that. I've done a few sort of splash images. Oh, really? Um, yeah. So one, uh, and I remember flooding, flooding my kitchen <laughs> at the time. Actually doing that. Yeah. Nice. Um, so did, one, one thing that was fun um, is I did a sort of a splash photo um, of a it's like a rubber duck. It's like a punk duck, and um, the idea was to drop it into like a, a container with water in it, mm -hmm. and to capture um, to capture the splash essentially. Um, and the way I did it was uh, I had a sound sensor. So the, the whole thing was triggered by the impact of the duck on the water. Um, and that basically triggered the, uh, the shutter on the camera. Okay. So, yeah, so, um, and that worked rather well. The only problem is, uh, you know, by virtue of 
of using bulb mode. So bulb mode in a, in a camera is essentially when the shutter is permanently open. So you mm -hmm. imagine you're in a completely dark room. So it's pitch black and the, the camera shutter opens and it stays open. And of course it doesn't expose because there's no light. You know, obviously you need light for exposure. So the shutter is open and then by firing a flash, you create the exposure. So actually just to clarify, um, so the remote trigger, the sound trigger, wasn't actually triggering the, the shutter on the camera. It was actually triggering the flash itself. So uh. camera shutters open in bulb mode, the flash fires, and you create the image. And uh, yeah, so and that way you can freeze some really fast motion um, really quite effectively. And, uh, and that's exactly what you've got to do if you want to capture these, uh, these kind of splashes and you want to make sure they're really razor sharp. That is a really good uh, method, you know, um, of doing that. Very, very cool. So given that you're in bold mode then, mm. what, how did you determine what power your speed light should be at? How, how, did, how did that kind of work? So I guess okay. that took a bit of trial and error to get that kind of right. Well, a little bit, but the, the basic assumption, so if you know how a speed lights actually function, um, so the, when you increase the power um, on a speed light, what happens is it actually creates a flash um, that's longer in duration. So mm -hmm. if you want to freeze something that moves very fast, you want to basically uh, diminish the or you know decrease the exposure time as much as you can. So you want that flash to be as short as humanly possible, and that means you got to take the power on your speed light down. So really, you know, you're probably shooting at like one sixty fourth, one thirty second, something like that um, of of power. Um, on the um, okay. on the speed light, and uh, and that's what creates this really, you know, fast flash, and it'll you know, it'll expose uh, it'll expose the image. Um, takes a little bit of ex of uh, experimenting, sure. but um, it's relatively easy to to create some good you know good looking images that way. In fact, in this particular uh, folder, I remember I actually had two uh, two flashes or two speed lights set up. So the the main speed light was triggered by the by the sound sensor and uh, mm -hmm. that was effectively utilizing the uh, the microphone in my phone so um, there used to be a company called trigger trap and they used to make these different types of camera triggers um, so there were some sound triggers and some light triggers and um, I'm sure other comp other companies make them but trigger trap was just a really fun company that they, they don't exist anymore unfortunately they've gone bust. but um, they used to make all these little gadgets that you could buy and uh, so you could connect them to your phone. That was the whole idea. You connect these to your phone, and then that effectively allows you to connect your phone to your camera or to your flash, and you know trigger that. Um, so anyway, so the the main flash was triggered by the by the sound sensor, and then I had a secondary flash um, that was uh, set to receiver mode. And what that means is this little light uh, cell on the on the front of the flash, mm -hmm. and that basically activates the flash as soon as that sensor sees any light. So the main flash fires, the, the secondary flat, uh, flash sees the light and fires as well. So mm -hmm. that's, of course, that happens pretty much at the, at the speed of light. Um, and so, you know, I had one flash uh, exposing the duck and another flash just, you know, pushing in some light from the, from the back just to kind of illuminate the, the water and the container. It's like a glass container um, a little bit from the back. So, yeah. It was. Uh, it turned out. It tur it turned into an all right image, I guess. Um, but uh, I remember I did this at like something like one o'clock in the morning or something, and I was sharing an apartment at the time. And my uh, my flatmate was out, and he he came back just at the moment when I would literally flooded the whole the whole kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. So he he literally stepped into a pitch black kitchen because I you know I'd like uh, blacked out all the the windows and everything, mm -hmm. and uh, and the only thing he could hear was just like you know, his shoes, <laughs> his, his feet stepping in water. Yeah, that's pretty terrible. Have you, have you still got the photo? Yeah, I have the photo, yeah. yeah. Oh, mate, oh, we're going to have to post that on the group. I, I yeah, really well, yeah. That. I'll, I'll post it on uh, Facebook. Awesome, yeah, fun little awesome, photo. awesome. You know, I want to do something very similar to that if I can, um, mm. just have a, have a go. It's not something I've really experimented much with before. Um, but yeah, I, maybe I'll start small. I don't really want to get... I live in a rent, in rented accommodations. <laughs> <laughs> so was I at a time. It didn't hold me back. <laughs> <laughs> nice man. Yeah, it's it's interesting um, triggering your 
your camera or your flash in different ways. Um, so this this way of using bulb mode, by the way, um, you know, you can use it in, in a lot of different um, different situations. Um, I did another photo uh, some time ago where I wanted to get a photo uh, where I would basically swing my head to the side and uh, I would kind of freeze my hair flying past. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was done in a very similar way. That time I triggered the, the, the flash with a, uh, um, with a remote control. So um, the setup was exactly the same as bulb mode. So I was in a, in a pitch black room mm-hmm. and I was just moving and hitting the remote button at the same time. And it would just take the picture. And it just takes, you know, however many goes until you get an image that's the way you want it to be. But, you know, it's good fun. It's definitely a kind of project I would recommend, you know, if people want to play around a little bit and try some different things. Um, uh, you know, you can get some really, really interesting results yeah. that way. Maybe that's uh, another one of our challenges in the future, you know, a picture done using bold mode, you know, and Absolutely, it's, not, yeah. it's not something I typically venture into. It's a great sort of thing that you can do at home, mm. you know. Um, so these are the, the kind of little photo projects um, that will, A, they're fun, and you get some interesting images that way, but also you learn a lot. You know, so from from an educational point of view, um, they're really uh, really cool little um, so projects that you can do. You know, and you don't really need much. I mean, you need a speed light. If you have one flash, for example, you know, one speed light, it could be a cheap one like Yongnu uh, type of speed light. It doesn't have to be anything uh, outrageously expensive. You can do you can do a lot of damage with these. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, you know. I mean, that, incidentally, that's the brand of speed light I use. Um, you know, I think it's it's been great. I've had it for years now, and it's it was only. Yeah. I think ninety pounds at the time, and it's one of their their better ones, if you like. And I don't think there's much difference between that and uh, an Nikon or or Canon Speedlight. Yeah, so the Nikon's um, I have a a Nikon um, Speedlight, which is actually really really pricey at the time, and um, the only difference is the power. I mean, it has like X amount of different functions that you never use. Yeah, realistically, you know. Um, uh, it's it's more powerful than than the other the other speed lights I have for sure. I mean, it's by far the most powerful flash. Yeah. Um, if that's something you need, like if you're, I don't know, if you're doing reportage or you know something like that, and you need a really powerful flash, that's probably the one for you. But um, you know, so other than that, um, Cactus is a really good speed light brand. Mm-hmm. Um, they're sort of a Chinese brand, but they're um, I like their triggers. And I like the way that they, you know, build their, I like the build quality of their, of their speed lights. Mm. They're really, you know, they don't break the bank too much. They're not by far not as expensive as the kind of branded, you know, Canon and Nikon yeah. flashes, but they have, uh, you know, build, build in uh, radio receivers. So you get radio triggers, which is really, really useful. Yeah. Um, and the receivers already built into the flash, which is perfect. And they work perfectly. I've used them on so many shoots. I can't even tell you. I mean, I've used them. On international shoots, you know, that's the one thing with speed lights. Um, and I think I've mentioned this, you know, previously, um, especially when you're traveling, like when you're flying out to a location and you're doing a shoot, um, it's really, you know, you've got to travel light. So, mm. uh, you know, taking like copious amounts of studio, uh, studio lights with you is just not going to happen. So if, you know, if you're doing, uh, portrait work or, um, headshot work or anything like that, speed lights, speed lights, is totally the answer. Mm. you know um, I've really I've run my business on speed lights for several years <laughs> you know it works well mm-hmm. um, but yeah so um, but just like any tool or any piece of equipment you know you have to spend some time um, and uh, and learn how to use them properly and that's you know there's lots of like I said again there are lots of uh, little uh, photo projects that you could uh, that you could do at home mm. uh, maybe in one of the Next few episodes, we'll talk about some specific uh, uses for speed lights that might be quite interesting. Yeah, great idea. So, Kay, anything else that's caught your eye this week? Well, yes. So, finally, um, I found something that made me think of you. <laughs> okay. Um, this better be good. <laughs> uh, well, you love it. You love it. Um, so, there's this guy called Tristan Poyser, and he's an event um, photographer uh, from London. Uh, actually, I say event. He's, I think he's a um, he's an architectural and advertising photographer. Okay. And of course, um, his business, you know, went down the drains during lockdown. He had sure. uh, you know, contracts cancelled, 
uh, and so on and so forth. So, and eventually he figured um, he's just going to have to find a different way uh, of making a living in the interim. So he got himself a job at Amazon. Oh, right. <laughs> of all places. So yeah, he, so he was just simply um, working in the Amazon um, warehouse. Mm-hmm. And so being a photographer, at some point he thought, oh, it might be a good idea to um, just you know take some pictures and to document you know what's happening um, inside of, uh, of an Amazon warehouse. And uh, so in order to get permission for that, he essentially went into LinkedIn, found lots of people who had anything to do with communications at Amazon and emailed them all to ask for permission. And eventually he got granted um, permission to take some portraits and um, and to take some photos um, of the the inner workings of an Amazon warehouse. Um, And his photos are actually, they're really, really interesting. So what kind of photos did he end up taking uh, are these off just general goings on in a warehouse or people or what, what did this, what was his approach yeah so he started with portraits um okay. and then um he he was somehow commissioned by historic england i'm not too sure what the uh, connection was there but um so amazon eventually asked him to uh, document the the fulfillment center and maybe you can clue me up in uh, in exactly what it is because I'm not I'm not sure I'm guessing is that just a normal warehouse yeah thing yeah, yeah. so they call it fulfillment center yeah that's my... <laughs> whatever <laughs> anyway it's the warehouse um, so yeah so he was uh, um, he was asked to document the fulfillment center and uh, and in particular uh, show the safety measures that they put in place uh, for COVID nineteen. Um, and to do it in a creative style. So I think from Amazon's uh, Amazon's perspective, it looked like, you know, a bit of a PR exercise, essentially. Yeah. I mean, my initial reaction was I'm, I was very, very surprised that he got permission to to do it. Amazon are typically quite, um, uh, you know, it, it, they don't like that sort of thing to happen, let's say, in normal circumstances. Mm. Um, but you can you can go on a public tour I think of a warehouse in uh, in Luton, if, me- if memory serves me right. So Can you really relax that attitude a little, a little bit there? And you know, I'm sure they want some, you know, like you say, some positive PR that you know the you know the PPE and the um, sort of procedures that they've put in place within the warehouse is you know protecting workers, and you know that's a it's a good message to get out there in the current current state. Absolutely. I'm just intrigued by the fact that you can uh, do a public tour. I'll tell you one thing, when things go back to normal, right, and this is possible again, you and me, we will go on a pu- <laughs> public well, Amazon I, warehouse I went tour. There. I, w- I went there once um, on a uh, kind of an, in- an internal um, for st- staff kind of uh, mm. sort of day. So um, people in like in a corporate office could understand, you know, what actually goes on in a warehouse, you know, it helps your general understanding of how the company, company sure. works. Really good idea. And uh, so I've been in there and, you know, I've, I've done some picking while I was in there. I've, uh, you know, kind of done all the various kind of activities that might might happen. And it's, it's as warehouses go, it's quite an impressive, impressive place and you know, massive, absolutely massive. What a place. Um, so I, 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 I'd highly recommend it if you've not really seen the inner workings of a warehouse like that before. It's really interesting. Mm-hmm. Well, when I get to shoot warehouses like this, because that's exactly what I do, um, you know, I, I photograph uh, big buildings like distribution centers, warehouses like that. But usually when I'm there, they're empty. Yeah. They're completely empty. And it's um, it's something to behold, I have to say. I mean, it's, you know, the size of these buildings is, yeah. you know, I shot um, a, dist- a brand new distribution center for a uh, German company that I cannot name, unfortunately. But um, the the distribution center was so large it fit three jumbo jets inside <laughs> it was just it was just um the most immense building and to be inside of that space i mean from the outside it just looks like a huge building but when you're inside um you know everything seems amplified every sound mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know it seems to <laughs> it felt like it has own little you know micro weather system in there it's just so humongous and um Typically, they have these kind of rack systems um, built in. There's no, there's no shelving or anything. It's just these these metal girders, and it's literally you feel like you're in a forest of metal girders. Yeah. It's just, uh, it's such a, 
you know, it's almost awe-inspiring. In a weird industrial way, it's really quite an awe-inspiring um, experience. Yeah, it and really is. Uh, I quite like I quite like doing those kind of shoots. It's um, you know, um, it's, it's a little bit different, but I weirdly I quite enjoy being in that sort of environment. So I play this little game with myself. I always try and find a like a, a Star Wars kind of shot. You know, because it's, it's that kind of industrial design type of a thing. You know, there's lots of concrete and lots of steel and like, mm-hmm. uh, you know, um, so, and it's, you know, without fail, there's always a little space somewhere where the light is just so that, you know, you can get this sort of shot that could come, that could have been like straight from the set of Star Wars. Nice. You know? um, so, yeah. Nice. And the other thing is, of course, I love these really super smooth um, kind of concrete kind of floorings. And every time I'm, I'm in one of those buildings, I can think of next time I'm going to take my longboard. You know, it's going to be perfect for skating. Yeah, nice. <laughs> you can't help but touch it as well. <laughs> oh, yeah, 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 yeah. It's, uh, yeah, it's they're really fascinating spaces. You mm. know, it's, um, mm. yeah, you know, humankind has, has come a long way to build weird spaces like that. Yeah, for yeah, sure. From, for sure. Straight from a cave into a massive, massive warehouse. <laughs> So, yeah. well, I'll definitely check out these photos that he's done. Um, I wonder what uh, fulfillment center he was at. Uh, I'll be, I'll see if I can work it out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it'd be super interesting. Yeah. <laughs> so we've almost come to the end of this week's episode. But before we go, let's just have a quick chat about the new photo challenge that we've decided to, uh, to put together. So every month we're going to set a subject and uh, that's going to be an opportunity for our viewers and listeners to take part in. Then you guys can send us your entries either via Facebook or by email. And we'll choose the, uh, the winning entry uh, from that. And the winner will be able to get to come onto the podcast and uh, talk to us directly. And we can have a little chat about the photo. So I've had a little rummage around and I've found a photographer called Elke Vogelsang. And she takes really amazing um, animal portraits. Um, so uh, it's usually dog portraits and they're really quite goofy. So I thought, well, that might be a, a good idea for a little uh, pet photo challenge. Also, I've been slightly inspired by the fact that we're going to get a puppy in the next few weeks. So yeah, I probably played into that <laughs> a little bit. I've got dogs on my mind. Take a photo of your pet and uh, send it to uh, send it to us via Facebook or via uh, our email address, and that's cameraShakePodcast at gmail.com. And you'll have until, well, in this case, I guess, you'll have until the 30th of June uh, to complete this challenge. And then we're going to start a monthly roll after that. So if you send your photo to us uh, by the 30th of June, we'll pick the winner, and the following week we'll talk to you on the podcast. So I hope you enjoy this challenge. Well, that's it for this week, folks. You've been listening to the Camera Shake Podcast with me, Kirsten Nuts, and Nick Kirby. If you're listening to the audio version of this podcast, of course, please do us a favor and subscribe to the Camera Shake podcast over on YouTube or head over and drop us a like on Facebook. And remember, if you like taking photographs, take part in our photo challenge and get your images sent to us. Without further ado, see you next week.